ready for a great presentation. We will be starting in shortly. Thank you. Great, thank you. I think I'm gonna hand it over to Dana Ladd. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, I'm Emily Hurst, I'm the Deputy Director at the Health Sciences Library, and we are going to start our presentation today. So Dana, take it away. Great, thank you so much, Emily. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for promoting patient engagement through clinical trials participation, featuring ePatient Dave. I'm Dr. Dana Ladd, VCU Medical Center Health and Wellness Librarian. The program today is a collaboration between VCU Libraries Health and Wellness Library and the VCU Wright Center for Clinical and Translational Research. As some of you know, we have been conducting several clinical trials basics and consumer health training information training sessions for local public librarians and staff working in uh, Virginia libraries to help equip them uh, to equip their patients to become more engaged in their own health. And as a part of that program today, we have a very special speaker who is going to share his inspiring story of being diagnosed with stage four cancer, enrolling in a clinical trial, which ultimately saved his life. But first I'm gonna introduce my project collaborator, Lauren Harris. And she is going to introduce today's speaker. Lauren is the Senior Hub Research Capacity Administrator at the VCU Wright Center for Clinical and Translational Research. There, Lauren is responsible for overseeing all aspects of the planning and implementation related to the Hub Research Capacity Corps by providing innovative methods for recruitment of diverse participants into VCU clinical trials. So I will turn it over to Lauren, who will introduce our guest speaker. Thank you so much, Lauren. Thank you, Dana, um, for that warm introduction. Um, our speaker today, Dave de Brunkhart, known, known on the internet as ePatient Dave, is the author of the highly rated Let Patients Help, a Patient Engagement Handbook, and one of the world's leading advocates for patient engagement. After beating stage four kidney cancer in 2007, he became a blogger, a health policy advisor and international keynote speaker, an accomplished speaker in his professional life before cancer. He is today the best known spokesman for the patient engagement movement, attending over 600 conferences and policy meetings in 19 countries, including testifying in Washington for patient access to the medical record under meaningful use. Dave is an engaging and passionate speaker. Um, we invited him here today to share his story and participation in clinical trials that ultimately really saved his life. We wanted to highlight opportunities for patients to be more engaged and learn about their health and learn about potential opportunities such as participating in clinical trials. Um, we hope that this talk will empower patients to be engaged and to advocate for their health and healthcare providers will also be inspired to encourage patients to be active and engaged in their health. At this time, I'm going to turn this over to Dave. Let's see if the robots work. Hot diggity. It's, it, 
you are seeing my slide, yes? Yes. Wonderful. I love it when technology works. So it's really good to be here. I'll tell you, as somebody who has done a whole lot of speaking I'm, and the industry just went dead for two years, it's so, so great to be having things start back up again uh, that I decided to get dressed up in a coat and tie as if I were going on stage just because it's so, well, it's exciting and I'm easily excited. Uh, it's great to be alive. And I have always throughout this odyssey been a big fan of the role that librarians can play in bringing important information to people in need. I'm gonna be sharing my story as you heard but in the course of these hundreds of events, I've done not just speaking with, but listening to people uh, in audiences around the world, I've come to understand that there are ways that when science unfolds in the best possible way, it's not always through the usual channels. And I hope that you will leave this presentation with a clear sense of how you can make a difference in people's lives in ways that may not have been obvious when you woke up this morning. So having said that, let's get to it. Uh, let's see, now I gotta make PowerPoint behave. Here we go. Uh, one commercial disclosure, I have a day job as, uh, believe it or not, there is a company in Toronto that has made me chief patient officer. It's amazing making sure that the voice of the patient is part of their ongoing business. Uh, and so that's it. That won't touch on anything we do today, but I need to disclose it because I get paid for it. Now, how I came to be here, I was a random guy. It's really important to understand that although I went to a technical college, I have never worked in technology and science. It's just something I learned in school. I worked in high-tech marketing, particularly in the graphic arts. I'm a data geek. I do things with Excel. I like tech trends and automation, but there is nothing medical in my background. In 2007, 15 years ago now, which is hard to believe, as you'll hear, I discovered I was almost dead from stage four cancer and I got better in less than a year. In 2008, I started reflecting on this industry that had saved my life and started blogging about it. And in 2009, a number of things happened. Uh, I wrote a blog post about garbage in my medical record. And if you haven't checked out your record personally to look for mistakes, you really should. You're entitled to see every bit of it. And almost everyone's record includes mistakes. I couldn't get a straight answer from my hospital. So using the power of social media, I blogged about it. And unexpectedly, I ended up on the front page of the Boston Globe, and people started asking me to give speeches about it. And around the same time, as you'll hear, my doctor and I and some colleagues formed a Society for Participatory Medicine. And as the word suggests, that's where the patient is not just sitting back having things done to them. My doctor likes to refer to it as some patients act like they're a car in a car wash. They just get things sprayed on them. Um, and I started giving speeches. In 2010, I left my day job and started doing it in full time. In 2011, I did my TED talk in the Netherlands and things really took off. And then I don't know why people in 2012 medical school started asking me to come talk. And now, as you heard, it's actually, it's expanded. It's 26 countries now. It's been crazy. My mission, having not died 15 years ago, is to spread the word about how new things are possible that most people, including most doctors, are not trained about in medical school. And in particular, how ordinary citizens can help themselves when everything is on the line. Fundamental principle here, knowledge truly is power and librarians are the guides who can help people connect people in need with knowledge that might make a difference. In my book, this is my 
now famous primary physician. It just tickles me that my doctor is famous because of largely because of me. He was famous in the IT world before, but anyway, notice on the cover of that book, that's a publicity photo, but it's realistic. We're both looking at the computer together. And one of the aphorisms in the book is we can perform better if we're informed better. Now, here's the thing, the point where, see, most people have no need for a clinical trial. So in this talk, we're gonna be focusing on cases beyond that. For most medical problems, the remedy is clear, but at the fringe of knowledge, where you are out of textbook solutions, librarians can help find the latest information, right? And I, I think this is important to understand because nothing I'm talking about here is a radical overthrow of science. We're talking about when you get to the edge of the cliff or where there are no more bookshelves or whatever, you are at the leading edge of science. Fundamental principle number two, Patient is not a third person word, you know, and this statement comes from the, the very first healthcare related meeting I attended outside Boston uh, in about 2008 or maybe 2009, I don't know. It was the first time I'd been asked to be a panelist on stage. And in the first half of the day, my chair was empty up there. And then I went up after lunch and I said, you know, I've, listening to everyone talk this morning, what I noticed is everybody's talking about patients as if it's somebody out there on the highway, All right? And I'm here to tell you, it's not a third person word because your time will come. And I know I'm sure some of you in the audience have had this experience yourself where you realize, holy crap, I'm in trouble. My mother's in trouble. My child is in trouble. And it changes how you think about the things. So in the discussion today, in addition to thinking about how you might help others, you better be thinking, you want to be thinking, how will you behave differently? In our preparatory comp, uh, calls before to create this event for you, uh, the, the people at VCU Libraries mentioned this book, which I immediately latched on to, ladies and gentlemen, I've read a lot of books of cancer patient stories. I have never read one as powerful as this, because it's not just, I mean, this woman was dying of malignant melanoma, something that most people don't survive. She got into a clinical trial. Clinical trials are no guarantee. Most people who go into a clinical trial don't do better, some do. And this, but this, see, she's a New York Times and Slate.com writer. Uh, and there's something about a powerful storyteller. She really knows what she's doing. So I heartily endorse this book. So it's Catastrophes and Miracles. So as we get started, when you're at the edge of knowledge and out of options, clinical trials may help. So people should ask, are there any clinical trials? Even if there are, they may not be right for you, but if, if you want to do everything you can to try to survive, don't hesitate to ask. Now, I need to give you some background about how I wobbled into this world. As background, starting all the way back in the 1980s, this doctor, Tom Ferguson, was a real advocate for patients being informed. Way back then, he published a magazine and then a book called Medical Self-Care. He knew that we ordinary people aren't doctors, but he also knew that when people have more information, they're better able to do the right thing and do useful things. And when the web came along in 1994, he started spotting people, which are these people across the top row here, who were doing some of the things that he had anticipated as a result of a breakthrough. My primary physician, Danny Sands, is over his, uh, his elbow there. He, was, he connected with Doc.com because Dr. Sands co-authored the first peer-reviewed journal article 
on how doctors can do email with patients without it ruining their lives. And that was in 1998, ladies and gentlemen. So if your doctors are giving you any grief about doing it in 2022, they might be a bit behind the curve, all right? And he coined this term that e-patients are equipped, engaged, empowered, enabled. So this has been going on for decades, all right? This isn't, if, if current doctors don't know that and they get arrogant, it's a little ironic because for an arrogant person to be out of date is like, yikes, what's going on here? Anyway, here we are in that publicity photo. Uh, a lot of people complain about how about bad usability of EMR systems these days. Uh, and the doctor commonly has their nose buried in the computer. Ask the doctor to turn the screen so you can see what they're doing. You know what? Doctors make typos. All right, so do that. We were doing this back in 2008 for this photo. And as I said, we co-founded, we were among the 14 co-founders, all the friends of Tom Ferguson, who founded the Society for Participatory Medicine. It was at this point that I started to feel like Dorothy getting swept up in the tornado, because that summer, Health Leaders Magazine, which goes to tens of thousands of health executives, called after that front page publicity story about the garbage in my medical record and said they wanted to write about this when they heard about our society. Much to our amazement, they made it a cover story. Now, we did not have some $100,000 grant from Robert Wood Johnson or something. We didn't have a PR agency going around pitching our story. This was the editors of Health Leaders in 2009 telling their audience that they considered people like me to be the patient of the future. And they got the key point right. If you look in the oval there, it's about a new relationship where the patient looking things up on the internet is uh, is able to change the doctor-patient relationship. They sent photographers to visit some of us, and I figured it would be the usual, you know, just a snapshot of my head to go in a column of type. Quite honestly, if I'd had a PR agent advising me, I would have worn a different shirt because I had no idea they were going to make me full page on the type table of contents. I was really thinking, I mean, so this is it. The patient of the future is a middle-aged middle slump in a tacky shirt looking things up on the internet. Welcome to the new decade, folks. Well, then every, but that's kind of the point that the editors of health leaders were saying to the hospital executives, this is the future. Now, every December, they do 20 people who make healthcare better. Number one on the list was Atul Gawande, the phenomenal essayist. Uh, and surgeon. Number two was Dean Kamen, the inventor of the Segway scooter. He's had a number of medical in inventions as well. Uh, much to my amazement, number three on the list was me in that stupid shirt. And number four was Dr. Sands. We really were in there together. And it raises the question, what did these editors see happening that made them think that this rebalanced doctor-patient relationship with an empowered, engaged patient belonged on the same page with Atul Gawande and Dean Kamen. Well, so it was at this point that I started to think seriously, am I really an indicator of the future? I mean, I felt a pull to go crusade for this, but I've known lots of people in my life who felt a pull to crusade for something and went bankrupt. So I looked for evidence, right? So I asked, so who's getting online? Well, I've been online since 1989, back on CompuServe, five years before the web. And you know, when I started using this slide, it was 20 years later in, 19, in 2009, and Pew Research said 83% of adults were online. So in a sense, what I was doing 20 years earlier became commonplace. Uh, but that's just one data point. One data point is another way to go bankrupt. So I looked for something else and I thought, well, who's romancing online? 
Well, you know, if you live long enough, things change. Today, it's beyond romance, for heaven's sake. You have things like Tinder and Ashley Madison. I, 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 I don't even want to, I've never swiped left. I don't want to swipe left. Uh, anyway, I found my wife on the internet on match.com back in 1999 uh, on match.com we were, a, were one of their earliest success stories uh she uh i'd been dating a woman in florida i live in new england and when that ended and a mutual friend told us told me about match i went there and within three weeks i found this woman who lived 12 miles away from me and I was like, dude, I'm going on a date in a car. This is awesome. Well, anyway, a year later, I got invited to give a speech about data in Paris. There we are on the, the roof of the Musée d'Orsay, the Impressionist Museum. Uh, so we decided to, we were already engaged. We decided to get hitched in May. Uh, next month is our 20, uh, 22nd anniversary and make a honeymoon in Paris out of it. You know by now that 10 years later, one in eight weddings in the US met on, are people who met online. When I first started using this slide, people gasped, really? Wow, well, and two years after that, one in five couples met online. Today, it's obvious and match is full of pollution. Anyway, that's how this got started. Now, my cancer story, uh, and there are books about this. I'll, I'll just give you the very short version. Uh, in 2007, I went in at the very beginning of 2007, I went in for a routine shoulder x-ray. And the next morning, Dr. Sands called me and said, Dave, your shoulder is going to be fine, but there's something in your lung. So this was total dumb luck. I had a sore shoulder and it just happened, the x-ray just happened to show lurking disaster. Uh, in my lung. And I will tell you, when your doctor says there's something in your lung that shouldn't be there, it will get your attention. I came in and had uh, a CAT scan of my lungs. And it turns out that there were five lesions in both lungs. These were already full grown metastases. We didn't yet know where from. That one was the size of a golf ball. And it turned out to be kidney cancer. Uh, the, my wife came with me for the alt abdominal ultrasound where they found the mass there. I, I'm fond of saying she's a, she's a veterinarian. She knows I'm not a dog, but she's seen lots of organs get ultrasounds. It, it turns out I had metastases all through my body. This is a generic diagram and I happen to be a poster boy for stage four kidney cancer. Totally by coincidence on this generic diagram, there's that spot in my lung. If you look at the left femur, I, it turns out I had a big metastasis in my left thigh bone, it eventually broke. Um, here's a patient safety tip. If you're going to have a pathological fracture of a big bone like that, pass out cold first because I had no pain. I fainted, landed on it. When I woke up, the leg was shaped sort of like a parenthesis. And uh, anyway, look at the head there. I had, this shows a, a brain metastasis. Mine was in my skull right near there. And because I'm an overachiever, I had additional tumors, including if you look at the head again, just before my treatment started, I had a tumor erupt from my tongue muscle. I had kidney cancer growing in my mouth. And that's aggressive. I was really sick. The doctors correctly said there was no good data on patients like me. Some people don't want to know, and that's fine with me. Nobody is saying that people should act like Dave. I'm saying if somebody wants to get involved, can we find a way to welcome them? I dug and dug and dug and but the, finally found a study that said for people as sick as me, the median survival was 24 weeks after diagnosis. Now I'm gonna share here for the first time. 
but I have a close family member with a new, very serious diagnosis. So we're all facing, it's not my wife, uh, we're, we're all facing this shock again. Uh, I, I remember vividly facing, the, the, thinking, what's, gonna, what's it gonna be like the last, what's the weather gonna be like the last time I look out a window? I thought, I remember mom's face at dad's funeral a couple of years ago. What's her face gonna be like? Sorry. And the hardest thing was to sit, well, sit down with my daughter and say, this doesn't look good uh, with her boyfriend. And I said, I, I don't want you guys to like hurry up and get married prematurely. We're going to deal with this with the best available science. And a condition like this, perhaps not this severe, will be in the background when somebody comes to you and say, I'm looking for information on X. Um, so after your shock, after the shock, you're left with a question, okay, what are my options? What can I do? Again, not everybody wants to dig in and become so super proactive. But if they do, what can we offer them? In my case, back in my hippie years in college in Boston, I'd learned a lot about mind-body stuff. And uh, I was keenly aware of this wonderful editor, Norman Cousins, who back in the 60s uh, had a lethal stomach condition. And he figured as long as he was dying, uh, he was going to laugh his butt off. So he rented a movie projector. There was no video back then. And he watched Marx Brothers movies. And much to everyone's amazement, he got better. Uh, and he later published this book, Anatomy of an Illness. Uh, at the time, see, not all science has been discovered yet. If we already knew everything that's true, we wouldn't need any more researchers, right? Today, we know there's a field called PNI, psychoneuroimmunology. And it may be what happened for him, we can't tell. But he published, you know, psychic mood, we now no, directly affects the nervous system, which we now know directly connects to the immune system. Anyway, he had this, the opening of his book was profoundly important for me, that every person must accept a certain measure of responsibility for his or her own recovery. That doesn't mean if you die, it's your fault. It does mean there's good reason to step into the saddle and say, what can I do? Now, I'm no big fan of, I like Marx Brothers movies, so I turned around. See, a powerless person will say, there's nothing I can do. Can you hear that? That's disempowered. There's nothing I can do. An empowered person, even if there might not logically be any hope, says, what can I do? So I told my friends, my birthday was coming up in the 21st century, I said, I want every Bugs Bunny cartoon ever recorded. And I got them on DVD and I watched them. And they're the wascally, web. I, I laughed. I said, I want the whole first season of SNL on, on DVD and I got it. So, uh, and then I asked Dr. Sands, I said, so this is him in clinic. I said, I'm getting tired in the evening. Should I drop out of my chorus? And he's big on this. And he, has, he actually wears this button. What matters to you? He said to me, the last thing you want to do is stop life activities that you love. It sends your body a signal that says life is shutting down. So I said to my friends, I said, OK, laugh and sing. It could be worse, right? Uh, and here, in fact, is a photo way over on the right side there. Well, I guess I'm not highlighted there, but somewhere on the right side, I'm in there. This is my chorus that I participated in. And then they sent me a, a diet. It said, you've been losing weight. You've got to stop that. So here is a diet titled, How to Increase Your Caloric Intake. It was put real whipped cream on all desserts. 
have pizza for snacks, get rid of all the low fat stuff, put butter on anything you want. And I said, that's it. People laugh, sing and eat like a pig. And if I get out of this alive, I will publish a book with that title. Now that was a stretch at the time, but you know what? I did. Once it got done, this is a transcript of my cancer journal that I kept on the website, caringbridge.org. Uh, anyway, now, a really important moment happened when, because Dr. Sands, remember Dr. Sands knew all those advanced e-patient people. He prescribed ACOR. I remember him saying, Dave, you're an online kind of guy. You might like to join this patient community. Look what happened here. First of all, even today, some doctors will say, stay off the internet. There is garbage on the internet, you know? That's, I'm fond of saying before I met Ginny on Match.com, I went to some suboptimal search results, but I didn't marry the first one. Dr. Sands didn't say stay off the internet. He showed me where to find the good stuff. And even today, one of the best sources for information on clinical trials, as you'll be hearing, is in a good patient community because they have nothing better to do then pay attention to where the newest possible life-saving developments are going on. Now, within the first two hours of me posting my first message on ACOR, look what I was told. First of all, welcome to the club. Nobody wants to join. We know what it's like. Now that might sound silly, but you know what? I'd never known anybody with kidney cancer. All I knew was I was probably dying. And here I am talking with people who got the diagnosis 10 years ago and they're not dead. All right, you think about Norman Cousins, that opens up the mental space for me to take action instead of sitting back and hoping that fate doesn't just crap on me. They said, this is an uncommon disease. Get to a hospital that does a lot of cases. Most hospitals won't tell you that they don't do a lot of cases, but when you're talking peer to peer, you find out what experienced people have experienced. They said there's no cure. At the time today, things are better. That's 15 years later, but this stuff called high dose interleukin two sometimes works. They said it usually doesn't work, but when it does about half the time, it's permanent and complete, voila. Here I am. They said the side effects are severe. They can kill you. Don't let them give you anything else first. And here are four doctors in your area who do it and their phone numbers. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm all in favor of the scientific method and peer reviewed literature and all that. But to this day, none of this exists in the peer reviewed literature. There is another dimension on the leading edge of care where new things are being talked about. Now, we're gonna come back to this incredibly important point here in a couple of minutes. For me, I was ridiculously lucky. My treatment started in April. I was diagnosed in January and it was over in July, six months later. Here is one of those tumors. They didn't cut me open when immunotherapy, this is immunotherapy, when it works, it's incredible. Uh, now, I had surgery for the broken leg and to take the kidney out, but that's it. All the rest of the tumors just shrank and disappeared. Indeed, I got into this because I was a participant in a clinical trial that was being done at my hospital. It's called the SELECT trial. You can look it up. Uh, ironically, you know, some people think all you need to do is find perfect science and you'll be saved. Well, you know, I was in a clinical trial. They were looking. Good clinical trials don't always find what they were hoping for. They were looking for a particular biological marker. As it happens, my condition on that marker said I would not respond to the drug, but I did. So woohoo for failed hypotheses sometimes. As a child of the 60s, I'm very interested in culture change. Uh, and so it was a thrill to me when the BMJ in 2013 came to me and said, Dave, we think your story should be told. Now, notice, 
I, number one, I respect authority. Uh, number two, I love being in the literature. Uh, but, and I didn't go to them, they came to me like the pu publishers of Health Leaders Magazine. Uh, this was the editors coming to me. Uh, and so I thought, since I want culture change, I thought uh, lots of doctors are gonna read this. So I went to my oncologist. I decided not to just publish my own perspective, but I asked my oncologist, David McDermott, what would you want other doctors to know about my case? And what he said surprised me. He said, I don't know if you could have tolerated enough medicine if you hadn't been so well prepared. He was talking about the side effects because I had asked the doctors and nurses, how do I prepare to survive these side effects? And they said, nobody's ever asked us that. Punchline, five years later, I came back on a follow-up visit and they handed me a booklet they created with advice on how to tolerate side effects. They, this leading cancer center responded to what the patient community said they needed. So now here's the question for the scientific mind, because as you can tell, we're at the point here where we're at the edge of knowledge, okay? How can it be that the most useful life-saving information can exist outside of the peer-reviewed literature that we are taught to trust, okay? And the answer is, as we said, knowledge is power. Access to knowledge has changed forever. Right? And this is a nice generic social media, oh boy, everybody's six degrees from Kevin Bacon. You know, we're all connected. But I, I, came to a, I came upon a medical metaphor. These dotted lines that connect all of us are precisely analogous to capillaries in the body. They are the information capillaries by which information can move to the point of need. And librarians can be the guides uh, so that it's not just happenstance about what ends, ends up where. Now, more paradigm changing thoughts here. You might wonder, what could I contribute? I'm not a doctor. I might not even be a medical librarian. There is more to it than that. There is a big problem, and I've given an entire separate speech on this subject of what's called the dissemination delay. How long does it take for new information to reach the point of need? And that's not just the patient, it can be the physician as well. You may have heard that the very first clinical trial ever was done by this doctor, James Lind, when the British Navy had large numbers of patients who were dying of scurvy and nobody knew, uh, nobody knew why, and he tried feeding matched pairs of dying men, different combinations of things. And he discovered that the ones who ate citrus survived. You would think that word of this miraculous discovery would spread like wildfire. In reality, 264 years before that news reached all corners of the British empire. So that's one factor, this curve here by the way, on, on this uh, just shows that as time goes by, that curve, that amount of time uh, has been getting shorter, but it still doesn't happen uh, automatically. There's another issue, and this just happened to my wife. Uh, my wife last fall had surgery on her spine. And yes, of course, I have her permission to talk about this. Uh, here we have what's known as silos. Uh, and, you know, silos are where somebody like her surgeon is an expert in their specialty and is completely blind to anything else. And at a conference called Health Data Palooza a few years ago, my friend Mark Scrimshire uh, put up this great tweet about this slide, he said, in Virginia, their health system has no silos, just cylinders of excellence. Well, if the doctor who's treating somebody is brilliant in their cylinder of excellence, there may be adjacent knowledge you can help with. The final word on 
peer-to-peer -peer health advice is this superb 10-minute video on SusannaFox.com. She is she is just the spirit guide for everything. She's the one at Pew Research years ago who did those, those studies that I was talking about. And this is exactly what I felt like. There's no one out here like me. You discover the people and wow, there's a whole group of people like me. Now, when I first started giving speeches about this story, skeptics reasonably said, well, okay, but Dave, I've never heard another story like yours. You are just an anomaly. Well, it's a legitimate point, but you, the, the skeptics have to be careful also. This woman, Janet Freeman Daly, lived in my dorm of my college a few years after me. And during my cancer year, she bumped into me at a reunion. Three years after that, excuse me, four years after that, she discovered that she had lung cancer. And as she is uh, fond of saying, in case you're wondering, I never smoked anything but a fish. Uh, and the, anyway, she, because she had heard my story, when things didn't go well, she joined a patient community. So I discover this by dumb luck. I, I, I survived by dumb luck. She bumps into me at a college reunion. And then when her time comes, so she started interacting with lung cancer patients. These are some slides of hers. Uh, within 16 months, she'd gone from stage 3A to metastatic. Things were not looking good. And in the patient community, she learned about a mutation called ROS1 that was just starting to get attention that her doctors hadn't heard about yet. And she was at a highly respected cancer center. It's not like they were slackers. <clears throat> she ended up getting involved in a clinical trial. She went from, uh, from Seattle to University of Colorado. And not only is she completely, let's see, what is it? No evidence of disease. Bam, she got in that clinical trial and it worked quick. Now, this is not normal. I'm not selling snake oil or miracle cures, but I'm saying if she had been passive, she would not have gotten into this clinical trial. This is a new possibility, nothing certain. You really, see, as a custodian of knowledge, you don't want to give false hope. But as I said to my oncologist on this subject, you don't want to give false no hope also, OK? So as Janet says, the purpose of a clinical trial to researchers is to experiment. To patients, it's treatment and, and, and hope. And if you're a fan of culture change, you'll be tickled by this closing sequence I have here or line of thought, it's more than a few slides. Patients have already helped design clinical trials now. And we're now moving to where patients are starting to take a role in steering the work. What Janet has done with her new lease on life is incredible. Just a few weeks ago, March 28th, she and her team announced this paper uh, in a highly rated uh, uh, oncology journal titled The Rise of the Expert Patient from Backseat Passenger to Co-Navigator. You see that shift? And I have a slide of my granddaughter I'll show you in a few minutes that exemplifies it. Because when she was born, she was gorgeous in the back seat, but she no longer uh, is just sitting back there telling people, uh, being taken, uh, Let's just say she has opinions about things, okay? Uh, and there's also our mutual friend, Sarah, uh, in Stockholm. She just last month got her doctorate in self-study, personal science. She has this brilliant graphic that's sort of become her trademark. Each of these blue dots is one hour in a patient's year. And the one red dot is the total amount of time she spends two 30 minute visits with her neurologist for her Parkinson's disease. And it's very clear that their role 
in their relationship is to improve her ability to self-manage 24 seven the rest of the year. And just last week, she published this new graphic. As I say, she just got her doctorate and she's now working on advancing this view of what personal science is. The very beginning of it. So there's this health issue and step one is the patient becomes aware of, I've got a problem and this is not going well. So they get help from the healthcare professions, hoping that it'll all get taken care of. Uh, but sometimes there comes a moment where you realize I'm on my own. I have to ask my own questions because what the industry has available is not sufficient. Uh, and so then she's documented this personal science cycle. And the final level up, uh, I wish I could do a series of talks on all of this because it's so exciting. Everything we talked about as possibility 10, 15 years ago is becoming real today. The simplest level of being an activated healthcare consumer is consumerism. This is where you yourself think, you know, where am I buying my prescriptions? If I don't like this doctor, am I going to change to another one? The next level up is e-patients, not just as a buyer of care services, but of being engaged in the contact conduct of your case. The final level up just astounds me. It's the next book I'm working on. It's called Super Patients. These are people who extend science. Now, Sarah's talking about N of one, applying the scientific method to rigorous studies of yourself, how her Parkinson's responds to different interventions. Super patients may be doing it at a more general level. Uh, and as I say, these are patients who extend science. My favorite current example, there are gonna be a dozen people like this in the book, is this guy, Doug Lindsay, who you can find on Twitter. Look, he was in People Magazine in January. I had to heal myself. No kidding. Look at the picture bottom left there. There he was in bed. He had to drop out of college because he had a familial uh, disease. I won't try to recall exactly what it was, but he had nothing. To, it just killed his energy. And he'd watched his mother die of it. And so just reading and reading for years in a hospital bed at home, he imagined a new surgery, I'm not kidding, and it took him two years, but he convinced his surgeons to try it and it worked, All right? This would not have been possible a generation ago before the internet, but what's possible has changed due to the information liquidity uh, and your ability to help people hunt for things like this could be transformative. So as I said, after the shock of a diagnosis like this, you're left with the question, what are my options? What can I do? What's my possible way out? When you're at the edge of knowledge, clinical trials may help. Now, I'll wrap up with the hunt. How do you find clinical trials? The usual place that everyone's told to go is the profoundly ugly and unusable website, clinicaltrials.gov. But it's comprehensive because everything that's going on in clinical trials is listed there. It's just hard to use. On the other hand, you know, you, if you're not a medical librarian, you have a network you can get at, right? Talk to medical librarians, help people find something that might work for them. As Janet found and I found, right, patient communities can be uh, a big uh, can be a big help. And then there's also this is uh, there's something on my website, uh, company I used to do some work for years ago. I don't make a penny off of this, but it's a really handy clinical trial search engine. You need to be aware that it doesn't contain every trial uh, in the world, but it's a source. So you can go to epatientdave.com and search for the word antidote. Now, one word of caution. <clears throat> Some clinical trials are not about new stuff. Some clinical trials are underway because a company wants 
to get approval to market something that's a duplicate of an existing treatment. In my opinion, I mean, those, those trials need patients, but in my opinion, that's, it's, it's a little bit silly to participate in an untested product that is only trying to equal something you can already get, All right? So it's prudent to ask, is this a me too drug or a truly new option? It's wonderful when something new works and I'll show you how this played out for me. This was December, 2006. This was New Year's weekend just before. I had just had that shoulder x-ray but I didn't know, know the results yet. This is a guy who was dying of stage four cancer and didn't know it yet. And I'll tell you what, I feel and look a whole lot better today than I did back then 16 years ago. Uh, 10 months later, my treatment had ended. I was diagnosed in January. The treatment started in April and ended in July. I haven't had a drop of anything since then. Uh, and um, at the office Halloween party, I was glad when somebody snapped this photo. There I was grinning at the ghoul, looking a bit different from the hair on down. I had pictured my mother's face at my funeral, but instead, in May of 2009, here we were laughing on the day where I, got to see my daughter get married. And then a few years later, guess what? I became a grandfather. And that's something worth living for. As I said, when she was 10 weeks old, she was just this beaming radiant creature in the back seat being taken. She had no clue what was going on. By age two, she had learned the two-year-old's favorite word, which is no. All right, now she was in no condition to be driving the car. All right, that will come years later. And indeed, some people worry that patient, patients get information, they'll do stupid things. Indeed, some of her friends will have accidents. Some may even kill themselves or others. But nobody would suggest that the remedy for the best possible future is to keep all the kids in the back seat forever. All right. In fact, role models are so important. Here is a picture that my son-in-law took of her during the Olympics. Um, I'm so inspired to think of what her life can be like, I'm, also, I'm, I'm worried, obviously, who's not worried about the future for our kids. Anyway, empowerment matters. Knowledge is power. Librarians can be a major help. I thank you for your attention. And I'm going to leave you with a question. I've recently been reading the great book, Tiny Habits, by the Stanford psychologist B.J. Fogg. Uh, I had the fun of introducing him and, and being on a reaction panel to one of his talks. Uh, and he said that he likes to end a lecture with this question. In what you just heard, what surprised you? you know, what do you know now or how, how do you think differently that you didn't? And most important, what can you do differently because of this lecture? And at this point, I'll hand it over for moderated questions. I guess we can stop screen sharing. I guess Thank I'm you. the one who stops screen sharing. Huh? <laughs> Thank you so much, Dave, for that inspiring talk. I know everyone here just to, I know we can now think about our patients that we help every day here mm. at the library, the hospital. I know we have public librarians on the call. This can, what you said today can truly inspire us to help our patients become more engaged in their own health, directing them to information that they can use to make appropriate health decisions. So thank you so much for just sharing your healthcare journey with us, your story. We, we really all appreciate it. And I know I speak for everyone on this chat when we say we wish you know, your family members health as well and we'll be thinking of you on that we really and we yep. appreciate you sharing with us so. yeah it's a life goes on you know and uh 
there's a, there are no guarantees, but what we can all do is strive for the best possible outcome. Exactly. You know, I take as a, again, as a child of the sixties, I, I have a lot of history in look, learning how to think differently. I was in Boston when the women's movement rolled through and there were these uppity women who wanted to understand their genitals, you know? And so they published, it's funny because I've since met Miriam Hawley was one of the founders of Our Bodies, Ourselves. The first edition of the handbook that they put together was titled Women and Their Bodies, third person. And then they thought, what are we talking about? It's our bodies, ourselves, right? So that sort of patient is not a third person word back in the 1960s. So anyway, let's do Q&A, let's do discussion. Yeah. So yeah, so I invite everyone um, who has joined us today if you want, we have, if you look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, at the bottom, there is a icon there with Q&A. So I invite you to put your questions in the Q&A part of the chat, just so we can find your questions easier than in, in the regular chat as well. So please go ahead and put your questions there for Dave. And um, it looks like I may have one. Yeah, we do oh. have one question. Okay. Yeah. I'll respond to that if I could wave my magic, magic wand. What thing would I change in common MD patient interactions? Uh, I, I would turn it around because it's time for you to be thinking that, right? Now, I obviously would, uh, I, I want more time. I, I want more, uh, I, what I really have, what I really envision is a world where Healthcare is not a series of little moments where you meet with the wizard, all right? But where health maintenance is an ongoing thing where I have a ton of access to all kinds of useful information. I'm one of these guys, I have a fitness watch and I have a, one of these sleep rings that really has improved my sleep and uh, all those things. Uh, and uh, I want it to be instead of transactions, like you come in with symptom X, Y, Z, and that means the system lets them assign condition code X and billing code Y, uh, and you do something and then get out of here because it's time to move on to your 12 minutes is up, right? Uh, you will die if you sit waiting for the system to catch up to that perspective. Get involved, do what you can to be responsible for yourselves. Um, what's next? So um, another question. So sometimes patients have difficulty obtaining a diagnosis for their symptoms. So they may be an undiagnosed patient. How can these patients who are undiagnosed be more empowered to advocate for themselves to obtain a diagnosis so then they can get medical treatment for their conditions? There honestly is no easy answer to this. Uh, easily the best situation, uh, the, the best generic cat categorical answer is see if you can find a good patient community because there you can find people who see that the system by design looks at the situation from its perspective. All systems do this. The uh, patients, as Susanna Fox's brilliant 10 minute video shows, patients look at it from their perspective. Uh, you will commonly find that somebody says, well, they thought it was condition X, but it turns out it was subtype 12, uh, which meant a whole different category of stuff. So I'm, Again, I'm not saying that this is an easy answer, but see, by definition, we're talking about cases where things aren't working out well. Sort of the left half of Sarah's diagram of system science versus personal science. Uh, I have a recent example. Uh, in January, a year ago, I discovered that uh, I had, out of nowhere, I had glaucoma. Uh, and if, you, so I'm partially blind on this side of my left eye uh, and uh, it had all kinds of implications for my life. But the, uh, 
it was really hard for me to find good, dependable information that wasn't written at a kindergarten level. Your doctor will tell you what you need to do, blah, 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 blah. Uh, it took me six months to find a good patient community because they were, it's fiteyes.com. They're not in it for, uh, for uh, commercial benefit. They don't even have the usual search engine optimization. And when I found them, boom, I found all kinds of things. I mean, did you know glaucoma and most eye conditions are managed by putting eye drops in your eye? And I know, Dana, you and I have discussed this offline, but there are no evidence-based standards for what's the right way to put eye drops in your eye. A whole field. So if you don't find it in the literature, you find the patients talking about it, right? Um, and so, yeah. That's, I guess that's the answer. Any one of these things I could go on for an hour. But. Dave, you just mentioned how it took you six months to find your patient community with glaucoma. Um, where do you suggest that people look for these online? Uh, well, a good place to start is with hashtag searches on social media because there is no directory. I mean, a lot of the patient communities that you find might, might be covertly sponsored by a drug maker. You just can't find, you know, you go there and they got a nice fancy website that obviously took a bunch of money to put together, right? But you can't find any mention of who does the funding. Uh, but, on the, but in other cases, you can. Now, smart patients, the one that I used, Acor, was a bunch of plain text mailing lists back then 15 years ago. They've now become smartpatients.com, which is really good for a number of diseases. Uh, there's also patientslikeme.com, which is good for other conditions. And then for individual diseases, uh, it varies. You can help as librarians if you can start, I, you know, if the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation grant ferry laid a $25,000 grant on me, I would want to start, I would want to accumulate and ongoingly curate uh, a list of good patient communities. I myself at epatientdave.com slash communities, I have a very out of date, poorly organized, poorly managed list of communities. And if anybody knows of any others, I'd love to add them. Yeah, somebody just um, listed in the chat that um, they found disease tribes to be helpful as well. Um, this particular person was saying that they use Google also to find tribe members. Um, so th it's good to know that it's several avenues to try and figure out a particular community so that you can gain information from it. Dave, there was another question that was submitted when you first started presenting. Um, and the question is, what is your assessment of pharmaceutical companies aspiration award, uh, the patient centricity? Where do, they, where do they get that right? And perhaps more importantly, where do they get it wrong? Uh, well, I tried very hard to avoid uh, sweeping answers on something like that. Uh, I think it's smart for anyone to be conscious of the fact that there may be unspoken alternatives. On the other hand, some of the most inspiring company work sessions uh, I've had have been with uh, pharmaceutical companies, you know? Uh, there are some conflicting motives, and yet there are also people there who really, really care. So uh, where anyone, government, industry, or anything, or, you know, for that matter, a community health worker, where they get it right is where they are really looking at things from the perspective of the person who has the problem. Right? If they are sitting outside and thinking, I know what this person should do, right? I've never been there, but I know they're, they're supposed to turn left here, trust me on this, which is, that's pretty much how my eight-year-old granddaughter operates right now. It's, she says, trust me, I know about this more than, anyway, the, uh, I don't think that's sensible. See, what you're really looking for is people who share your perspective.
And um, looks like we have a couple more questions in the Q&A chat. And one of them is, I'm intrigued by the proactive nature of building coping strategies to ensure symptomatic treatment. You mentioned the pamphlet from one organization. Have you found resources elsewhere that speak to this in a more generalized view of cancer? No, nothing comes to mind. Uh, it really is a matter of uh, stepping in and waiting around and finding what suits uh, your needs. Uh, and uh, when I say your, I mean, I know firsthand at the moment, this is not just the sick person. You know, everyone in the family, uh, is in fact, uh, as a side note, I want to also spotlight Susanna Fox's blog just in the last few days had a terrific new piece about caregivers, family caregivers, and how much uh, it can turn a person's life upside down and inside out. Um, and <clears throat> so they can be out looking for this information as well. And they, uh, I was amazed there, the, the motivation to go hunting for new information uh, and the legitimacy of that hunt can't be overstated. I was amazed to learn some years ago that on average, at that time, it took 17 years for new methods to be adopted by frontline doctors. The other thing that astounded me is that having heard this at dozens of conferences, people would just say it to each other and nod. Nobody knew what the source of that was and that they were toss, tossing it around. And finally, this wonderful uh, doctor named Ted Eaton uh, dug it up for me. It was a paper published in 2001. And what I found when I looked at the original paper was it wasn't just 17 years for everyone to be doing it. It was 17 years for half of doctors to be using the latest evidence-based methods which meant that in some cases, 20, 30 years later, many doctors were out of date. Uh, now, I don't go around saying, oh, blast those irresponsible doctors. They're not working hard enough because they are under immense pressure, especially in the US health system. But that's, see, that's where participatory medicine comes in. If you can step up in partnership with your physicians, or your family members, physicians, and say, um, I learned about this and it looks pretty sober and sane. What do you think? Right? That relationship can help bring new, newer information to the point of care. I also want to mention there's, there is no single authority. You know, Mary Elizabeth Williams, who wrote that wonderful book, Series of Catastrophes and Miracles, she got her care at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York City. I'd be dead if I had been there when my case hit, because at the time that my case hit, Memorial Sloan Kettering refused to use high-dose interleukin-2. They just had some objection. Uh, so there's... Again, this is a world where there are no absolutes. We're just all trying to figure out uh, what are the next options to explore. I really would love to hear something from somebody in the chat about what do you go, what what surprised you? What did you not expect? And what do you what are you going to do differently, or what could you do differently the next time somebody walks in? and asks about something like this. Oh, I yeah, see that we have yeah, two more Q and A's. Yeah, type into the chat what you would do differently after hearing Dave's talk now and put in there what capacity you work in. Are you in a library, um, healthcare provider and tell what you would do differently. So yeah, feel free to put that in the chat. And we do have another question in the Q and A chat, Dave. Um, it's uh, Dave, it feels like it feels like a long time we've been doing this patient advocacy. The inspiration story is wonderful, but sometimes 
what we get isn't a medical magic wand. Sometimes it's just not being alone. Sometimes it's you giving a medical magic wand to someone else, but there isn't anything for you. Some patient, patient, some patient spaces aren't so great. Would you talk a little bit about the other side of patient spaces? Well, Patricia, I, Patricia and I have known each other for years. Um, I'm in no position to tell you anything you don't already know. You know, this is, uh, you are an experienced, uh, you were an early pioneer and you're a real veteran of uh, the way things play out in reality. And that's reflected in your question. Uh, I would love to see some sort of a librarian chat space where you all, medical librarians and other librarians, uh, are able to discuss, you know, a patient came to me, a family came to me with this new diagnosis. What have you all found out there? You know, if that kind of a community, yes, I'm, I'm saying I'm like empowering you all to like step up and do what patient communities have done. Uh, if that kind of community, librarian community grew, imagine if you could go there and search pancreatic cancer or uh, end-stage kidney disease, right? And see what other librarians have found useful for it, because that's how it works, you know? That patient communities work because they talk to each other about what patients find important. Why not have librarians do the same for what librarians have found useful? This is how we go from being passive, disempowered, boy, I wish there was something I could do, to actually taking control and saying, this, this is what worked for me. Maybe it'll work for you. I don't know if that's useful, Patricia, but that's what I got for you. I know you're not somebody who needs advice on stepping up and doing things, right? But I'm talking to the whole community here. Yeah, yeah thank you, Dave. And we did get someone post a response to your question in the chat. And it's, I will remember your facing the grave slide and remember to empathize with their perspective. It's a very serious situation when someone shares their cancer diagnosis with you. I mostly encounter this in my personal life since I do medical library administration now. Mm. And I'm, I'm really serious, folks. Every single one of you get all your medical records and look for mistakes, all right? The evidence, one of the, a side hustle that I have, except I don't get paid, but a, a side thing that I'm involved in is there's a software standard that is the law of the land in the US now called FHIR, F-H-I-R. And it's, the software interface through which you and your future apps will be able to pull all your data together uh, in one place, the same way Quicken or Mint can pull your money data together from different credit cards and banks. And what people are finding is the same as other studies have shown, 80% of people's records contain mistakes. Uh, and the problem is, if that's, there's a mistake, like an allergy that's false or a medication that you're no longer on, if you get wheeled into an emergency room, right, or your spouse does or whoever it might be, and they're unconscious and they need to do emergency surgery and they look at whatever data they have about you and it's wrong, they may not be able to do what you need, right? And on top of that, so anyway, just get involved yourself. One of the best ways to coach other people on becoming an engaged patient is to be one yourself. And I speak <coughs> firsthand when I say the best time to do that is not when there are fire alarms going off. So just go to all and any doctors you have and ask for copies. They're not, I believe they're not allowed to charge you for it anymore. Um, and just start looking through it and saying, wait a minute, nope. One thing I found because I have one of these early fire apps is that I have, I've gotten care at four different hospitals for various things. They have different subsets of my medical reality, different, some of them don't know about medications, others do. 
some and uh, just getting them coordinated is a piece of work by itself. But it also lets you get a look behind the curtain there and say, oh, all right, so I can see what's going on in the doctor's world. And that's a big first step. Yeah, well, thank you, Dave. And um, so don't see any more questions in the Q&A. Please feel free um, to post any questions that you have yeah. in the Q&A. I do have another question from the um, planning group um, for this program that we came up with for you. And more of, I guess, a timely topic. Uh, do you think that the COVID-19 pandemic has changed or impacted either positively or negatively patient engagement? And what are some lessons learned from the pandemic? Oh boy. Mm. Well, what are some? So a real problem, the, the most of the um, politics and science are not a good mix. Right? And the uh, a deeper subject that uh, I gave a talk last week to NNLM, the Network of the National Library of Medicine, where the question of authority came up. Right? And uh, you know, we have people who just don't care what quote unquote the science says uh, about vaccines. Uh, and yet, if you, to understand the world of the physicians and scientists I've been uh, working with for many years now, uh, I've had to go back and look at the history of medicine and the history of science in general. And there are some <clears throat> major fails where uh, medical authority was full of crap and making stuff up. There was a surgeon who was a big deal mid-century in the last century named Halstead from Hopkins who had done some really, really good things. And he decided that the thing to do for metastatic breast cancer was radical mastectomy, which is butchery, just cutting out more and more of a woman's body. And to make a long story short, uh, when somebody tried in the 1980s to do a clinical trial to prove that radical mastectomy worked better, for one thing, the culture of medicine was so rigid that it took years to recruit enough patients because doctors simply would not go against authority and let them try something untested. And when this study was finally completed, it turns out that radical mastectomy, recommended by the best medical authority, uh, had zero, I'm not talking about a sloppy p-value for probability, zero benefit, right? So you have that uh, and just lots of other things where, and, and then of course, at the turn of the century on the subject of vaccines, the reason that so many people are skeptical about vaccines is because medical authority, a top tier journal, uh, let slip a study that had fabricated data. Wakefield's famous uh, uh, measles vaccine. Uh, and, and not only that, but the authorities took 10 years approximately to admit that they'd make a, made a mistake. Uh, and then when you combine that with all the people who are giving you promotional messages on TV about medicines, uh, where you know they have the, the the most obvious conflict of interest, and the 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 drug developers who are trying to get people into a clinical trial for uh, uh, a Me Too drug, not anything new. They just want a piece of that market. So it's a tough thing, and really good advice from experienced people who have the patient's perspective is the best thing going forward. I mean, you know, we now know, for instance, you know, Cambridge Analytica uh, allowed politicians to covertly target 
Facebook users using uh, fancy science and there are similar, so new technology enables stuff. It comes with new risks like all new stuff. Uh, learning and thinking for yourself, I think it simplifies things if we step away from the deeper questions and go back to, if I've got a family member who is pretty much out of options, uh, what can we do? And looking for clinical trials uh, is a good thing. And I, I, when I say that, I'm not invalidating the question because it is tricky stuff. But like, how do you know who you can trust? You know, so just don't let anybody tell you to trust authority no matter what. My favorite example, again, I'm a child of the 60s. Uh, I remember very well back in the 1930s, Fiorello LaGuardia, before he had the airport named uh, after him, was involved in an anti-drug uh, crusade called Reefer Madness. And I remember seeing the, a, a, tra a commercial for that that movie. Under the influence of the narcotic, the boy murdered his parents with an axe. And I don't know what kind of stoners you've run across in your lives, but that's not the ones that I've. So then somebody turns around and says, hey, trust authority. Oh. Yeah, thanks for answering that question, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be <laughs> this is going to be our last question um, that we have here for you. So, um, what are some ways that public librarians um, working with patients can really improve um, patients' ability to be more engaged in their own health or advocate for their health? So that's a really good question. I imagine people are asking for tangible things you can suggest that people do. Yes. Uh, and I think that would, well, so uh, I spend my time more in the stratosphere. And if you'd like to do any kind of a follow-up project, you know, we could, uh, we could look at that. A lot has to do with how awake people are, which varies, right, about the... Um, what's going on, what they could conceivably do, right? Uh, and uh, whether it's reasonable for them to even have an opinion. Uh, and that's, uh, I imagine that librarians, if they get a question about anything, have to deal with that all the time, like assessing, oh, what kind of person is this? Would this book that I know about be too much for them? Uh, I mean, the one easy way to start and I don't get a penny from this, from saying this, but my TED talk, uh, 16 minutes long, uh, people, lots of people have said that it made them realize it's reasonable for them to think for themselves and step up and take action. So that's um, one 16 minute starter. Uh, and then, you know, if they watch it and think, well, so how would I do this? Or, uh, you know, I, that makes me think, can I get more information about X? That would be uh, a way to start. The um, realizing that doctors and hospitals these days are often overloaded and under tremendous commercial pressure uh, to get work done because of the, the billing driven American health system. Uh, the, my, at the, end of the TED talk, I got people chanting, let patients help. That's all we're talking about doing is not patients thinking they're doctors. Um, and, and, and also uh, for the curious, a really easy way to start is again, getting their medical records and looking for mistakes. Because that makes you realize that, that they're human. And uh, it's also good, you know, for patients, to, for doctor's offices to get accustomed to people coming to them with, I found a mistake, could you fix it? Because, you know, if nobody, I've had so many people, doctors and audiences say, well, that's okay for you, Dave. Uh, my patients aren't like you. 
right? But if we have people coming along and acting like Dave saying, excuse me, like uh, Dr. Sands, that problem was in my right arm, not my left arm, right? And uh, then they'll see it differently. Uh, again, the social change of the women's movement, I think back to uh, back in 1912, when women's suffrage was on the ballot, uh, there was a pamphlet that I blogged about uh, reasons not to approve women's suffrage. And the number one item on the list is that most women aren't asking for it. Now, what a brilliant reason to let to say no women should be allowed to vote. It's because most aren't asking for it yet. Right? And the, uh, the other thing that we just, that has just had its 50th anniversary yesterday was the Boston Marathon uh, and it's the 50th anniversary of the first race where women were allowed to register. Um, and the woman, Catherine Switzer, the woman who had been thrown out, well, they tried to throw her out a few years before, 2016. So I guess it was, uh, what, 1966. Uh, the idea then, women weren't allowed to register because everybody knew that girls weren't athletic. Uh, and uh, in, in fact, when Title IX, the federal law was passed by Congress in the 1970s, saying that half of school sports funding had to go to girls' sports, my high school's athletic director quit. It wasn't that he was necessarily sexist. He just thought this was craziness. He said, girls don't even sweat. And like, really? So uh, a friend of mine, woman friend of mine said, he must be a lousy lover. Anyway, when that, a generation after that law was passed and girls had, so that was 1978. And then in 1999, there's that famous picture of the US women's team winning the World Cup in soccer, right? When you provide support to people who previously were disenfranchised, right? Their potential is revealed. And that's what I'm looking for, right? Is for healthcare to achieve its potential the best way possible, will be, which will be by helping patients be informed and engaged. Uh, it's, it's new, but it, really, it starts with one-to-one -one conversations where you say, you could try this too. Yeah, I think that's a very good a very good point that you bring up. Um, we a lot of times in what I do, I te try to teach patients to be their own advocates because um, we're our own best representative. And as you said, we're the ones that are well informed, um, and we just have to find our voice when talking to our physicians. So, at this time, I'm going to turn it back over to Dana um, so that she can close us out. Yeah. Well, thank you, Lauren. Thank you so much, Dave, for your inspiring talk. This was wonderful to hear your patient story and your call to be advocates um, on behalf of your own health. I hope those in the audience will be able to get those takeaways from you, whether they're working in public libraries and healthcare, their patient, that they'll be able to advocate for their own health, be able to work with patients to be able to advocate more on their own health, to be able to locate clinical trials, to be able to locate reliable consumer health information. I know Jackson and Emily have posted in the chat links to the Health and Wellness Library and other resources. We are always there to help patients, the community, public librarians locate reliable consumer health information. You're always welcome to contact us here at the Health and Wellness Library. We can help, help you find reliable consumer health information. We can help you navigate. Dave talked about clinicaltrials.gov being really difficult. We can help you navigate those things. And so we really encourage you to reach out to the Health and Wellness Library, to reach out to Lauren at the Wright Center we can help with a lot of the things that Dave talked about today to help you with if you are a patient or working with patients. So Dave, we really thank you for just kind of bringing this all together for us, sharing your story 
and encouraging us to advocate for our own health and that of our patient. And thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon for this talk today. So thank you so much and have a wonderful afternoon.